Hi, everybody. This is Dick Price. I'm the editor of LA Progressive. Today, I'm talking with Stan Cox, who is a senior researcher at the Land Institute uh, and, a, and a regular columnist on, on LA Progressive and a bunch of other sites. His most recent book is The Path to a Livable Future. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that book, Stan? Sure, Dick. Um, the Path to a Livable Future came out um, last November. I wrote it uh, in 2020, as the uh, pandemic was unfolding, it's about the um, intertwined roots of all of the crises that kind of converged in, uh, in 2020 and are, are still with us. Um, the the uh, climate emergency, systemic racism, uh, uh, the COVID emergency, and uh, it, the general uh, attack on, on democracy. It's about the how those uh, problems are all intertwined and we can't solve them one at a time. They all have to be dealt with uh, at the same time. Yeah, in that vein, you just recently, I think last week, wrote a, a fascinating article, Angry White Guys in Big Ass Pickups, about the hubbub that was going on in your home state of Kansas just around the uh, abortion vote. Um, and you and your wife, Preeti Gulati Cox, you live in Salinas, Kansas, which is the reddest heart of Trump company. What was going on in your state around that vote? Well, that that vote was a real bright spot for Kansas. We, uh, when we show up in the national U news, it's not generally not a celebratory occasion, but uh, but as you know, we uh, had a, a constitutional state constitutional amendment on the ballot in this very obscure August primary, which usually nobody turns out for. But our side, and the, and the, the amendment would protect uh, reproductive rights in this state, but which it, it was basically, uh, well, I'm sorry, the amendment was one that would have eliminated the guarantee of reproductive rights in our state constitution. We mobilized a huge uh, turnout on, on our side and, and uh, defeated the amendment. Um, the uh, article about pickup trucks goes back um, uh, farther than that. It's been a, really an annoyance of mine for quite a while, the growing size of uh, pickup trucks, the armoring of them with bull bars and so forth there. Um, actually, the advice reported that the, um, the full-size pickups these days are almost the same dimension as World War II tanks were. And, and so um, th these things then in 2020 became uh, kind of a propaganda um, weapon in, in which, you know, you remember the truck, uh, the Trump trains, the parades of pickup trucks, et cetera, and trying to run Bernie Sanders bus off the road in Texas and so forth. Uh, and uh, last year, um, uh, Bloomberg, I'm, I'm sorry, Boston Globe reported that there have been 139 uh, vehicular assaults on people, peaceful protesters in the streets. There, there's, there have been deaths and, and uh, injuries from that. Um, and, and they have continued, even some uh, uh, Roe versus Wade uh, supporters were um, run over in, in Iowa th this summer. Um, but the, um, it's a uh, uh, the, the, and one of the worst outcomes of this is that several states, um, Florida, Oklahoma, Iowa, have passed laws making it legal to run over uh, protesters um, if, if they're in the street and if you claim that you were fleeing in fear uh, from the peaceful protesters. 
Yeah, so part of the reason I was particularly fascinated by this article is, is even though I live here in the heart of LA, I mean, people look for miles around. There's the countryside is a long way away, but I grew up in Minnesota and spent a lot of time in small towns and on my uncle's farm in Northern Minnesota before that in a small town in Iowa and, and as a little, little kid and a real small town in North Carolina. And I, I wonder sometimes how my life would be different if I'd stayed any of those places, how I would be different. And I wonder how you and your wife and your liberal minded, climate change minded friends, how you survive in the reddest of the red country. <laughs> Well, we've, you know, we've got each other, and um, I, I tell you this uh, experience with uh, um, defeating that constitutional amendment, um, uh, the experience of organizing for that, and then the, um, the um, uh, joy at, in, with which we, we watch the returns come in, I think, has um, uh, really uh, energized people. Um, you know, people, it, it's always a dispiriting thing to go to the polls in uh, our local and uh, state elections or our elections for um, House of Representatives um, because we, um, you know, you're almost certain that your vote isn't going to count. On the other hand, we regularly elect uh, Democratic governors. We have one now, Laura Kelly. Um, so. And, the more we um, get out and, and uh, uh, struggle and go door to door and so forth, I think we, we've shown now that uh, we there are a lot more of us uh, than, than we think. Yeah, I would say that that was the one of the brightest pieces of news that have come along in this pretty difficult climate. Uh, and, I, and I guess, and, and so a lot of it had to do with, with on the ground organizing by people like you. Do you feel that this was sort of a flash in the pan in the reaction to the Alito uh, uh, decision? Or, or do you feel that this will be a lasting tide uh, for more progressive views? I, I think that it, we had um, a very large number of first-time voters, and you know, first-time voters hardly ever come out for, especially for a primary election. A lot of them were um, uh, unaffiliated with the either party and normally would not vote in, in a primary at all, um, except that they we got out the word, you're eligible to vote you know, just on the amendment. Um, Preeti and I worked uh, at one of the poll placings, poll places uh, that whole day, um, uh, helping, pe escorting people to the machines and, and helping them vote. And so we could see their registration and, and whether they were unaffiliated. And there were tons of uh, uh, unaffiliated people who I'm, I'm sure almost all were voting on, on our side. The um, estimate is that one out of five Republicans also were voting against the amendment. And we saw uh, uh, just an amazing number of uh, young people, especially young women uh, who uh, in Kansas, you know, generally you don't, you know, young people, especially at a, uh, in primaries, uh, aren't, you know, it's ma mainly senior citizens like me who are going, going to the polls at that time. but. Uh, and, and you know they say if somebody is convinced to come out or to vote, especially in a, an important election like this for the first time, they um, that tends to kind of get them interested. Um, they tend to have some commitment to the electoral process, and so um, in, in Kansas, we're going to do all we can to make sure that all those folks uh, come back uh, in the fall. Yeah, I, I hope it drives a lot of young people. Every every woman I talk to, whether they're of childbearing age or not, is is alarmed by this. Uh, whether mm -hmm. they're, uh, you know, very progressive or apolitical or even conservative. Mm -hmm. Go, going back to the size of the trucks, and I'll say, even though I'm kind of insulated here, occasionally mm -hmm. on our freeways, 
my poor 20 year old four cylinder Xterra has gotten blown off the road by mm -hmm. some big pickup truck, usually with a Marine Corps emblem in the back window that takes yeah. the whole whole thing and they, they, they seem to have to go 20 miles over the speed limit. Mm -hmm. But but part of it, I mean, so part of it's the truck, but then your, your article also talks about petro masculinity. It's mm -hmm. what's going on in the driver's heads. <clears throat> Can you talk about that at all? Uh, <clears throat> yes, that term comes from a professor, um, uh, uh, Kara Daggett, um, who has um, written a lot about this. And it's um, a lot of it is that um, men, you know, these um, right-wing men, um, see that the, the country that they um, may have grown up in or their fathers grew up in is, um, in their opinion, slipping away from them, that you know, there are all these uh, different-looking people and their women and so forth who uh, seem to be uh, having more and more uh, larger roles in, in society and and she says that it's they're really really hearkening back to a time like the 1950s where the the man supported the family the family uh, you know, moved out to the suburbs and, and the man was the commuter and, and this whole lifestyle uh, based on fossil fuels um, had uh, built up and and so the the especially the idea of uh, of uh, vehicles and um, you know, burning fuels um, has become uh, very much associated with masculinity. Whereas what I, it always occurs to me is that uh, these guys are covering up for some uh, feelings of uh, inadequacy and uh, you know, it's kind of a, a, a substitute for and actual uh, uh, masculinity. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember I was visiting uh, Sharon's daughter in Alexandria, Virginia, and, and out, of, out of a bar came these two Trump guys, and they were weightlifters. And, and I just was trying to put myself in, in their heads as, why are they so mad at me? And I, I, didn't have any, I didn't have a Bernie shirt on or anything. <laughs> I did have a black wife next to me, but it was like they're bolting down <laughs> the streets, and I'm wondering what's going on with them. But I will say, on, on somewhat in the defense of that, um, you know, blue collar jobs have disappeared. So it, it is harder for for people without an education to to support a family, even with two people working a job. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a part of what is really going on now. They turn that into blaming uh, immigrants and black people and and mm -hmm. anybody who lives in Mount Washington, where I live. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and also a lot of these guys are not um, struggling at all. You know, and the average cost of a full size a new pickup now is like sixty thousand yeah. dollars, and uh, they, and the image of the pickup is uh, the the farmer, the rancher, or the um, oil field roughneck, and you know the working people. And there certainly are a lot of are a lot of uh, pickups around here who are being driven by those people, but the majority of them, you know, are running around with clean tires, nothing in in the bed, and, and big uh, luxurious uh, uh, seats, and uh, they're they've become much more of a political statement than a utilitarian um, thing. <laughs> so. Aside from your, your support and interest in abortion rights and local politics, I mean, your real work has to do with climate change and agriculture. And, and well, just this morning, I read uh, another headline that the Arctic is mel melting even quicker than they had thought. I mean, so do you have thoughts on, yeah. it, it seems like, you know, we're, we're marching very quickly toward real, real disaster. Yes, <clears throat> and what I really um, worry about is that the probable passage of this uh, climate bill is going to create a sense of complacency and people are going to start thinking, um, well, we, you know, we haven't done anything about this for 30 years, but we've finally done something taken care of it. And of course, that's uh, 
that's far from the case. This bill is really a drop in the bucket for what we need to do, and it's not going to um, uh, have any direct mechanism for phasing out the use of fossil fuels. And if we don't do that, then all of this process you're describing is, is going to, um, to continue. Um, so um, I, I'm, I am um, very concerned, um, even, even though it's, it's great that this bill got passed, but to read in the news, or the, uh, this is the greatest achievement in climate le legislation by far in our history, uh, but that's saying a lot more about our failure of the past than it is about the ability of this bill to actually um, solve solve the problem. We really need even bigger uh, mobilization, climate mobilization in, in the streets to uh, demand you know, a direct um, uh, reduction of emissions and, and fossil fuel burning. The problem is now we have this fire hose of disasters coming at us, not, not least being the possibility of slipping into uh, an autocracy and, and uh, losing our ability to even have an effect at the elect in the elections. But there's all the other stuff um, as well. And so climate, uh, you know, people think it's important, but you know, we can't pay attention to everything at once. And what it means is that the voting rights movement, the racial justice movement, cli um, climate, um, all of these um, movements on, on the central issues need to come together and, and, um, and, and you know, act as one uh, big movement because we, got, we can't solve these problems separately at this point. Yeah, well, I, I certainly, I think we have a huge challenge ahead of us. And, and, and I'm always the glass half full guy in our house and I hope yeah. we can do something about it. Yeah. I really I appreciate too. your time. Thanks so much. Yeah. We will post this with your article and with your, uh, your page of articles. Thank you so much, Stan. Thank you. Great. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.